an extensive partnership with the World Resources Institute, our partner in pursuing this particular project, but as you'll hear, many more that are coming to follow it. And it also marks our entry into a new set of issues, the linkages between climate change and international trade. We here take the view, perhaps a little hyperbolic, but I hope not too hyperbolic, that what's likely to emerge over the next few years in the climate change context will produce the biggest changes in the global economic architecture since the Bretton Woods agreements. That we are headed toward a global regime to deal with the problems of global warming and climate change that will eventually, and perhaps in an orderly or disorderly way, uh, link together virtually all countries in the world with national policies to deal with climate change that then must in turn be reconciled internationally, either through agreements or some other way. And that's the question that we address in these studies. How does one try to achieve symmetry, cohesion, and cooperation between the emerging global regime on climate change and the existing, but necessarily to evolve, regime on international trade? And how those two can be brought to coexist not only consistently, but hopefully in a constructive and mutually reinforcing way as both go forward. The study we present today, Leveling the Garbon Playing Field, is the first step in trying to analyze the very tricky intellectual, not to mention political issues, that go into that equation and that we hope to start shedding some additional light on with our work. As I say, this is a result of a very intimate partnership between WRI and ourselves in an effort to blend their unparalleled expertise on the environmental and climate change issues with our work on trade. This book responds most immediately to the initiatives now being pursued on Capitol Hill. Uh, as many of you know, legislation on climate change is being very actively debated in the Congress. The Senate will be taking up the Boxer Bill or Lieberman uh, Warner Bill, as you wish to call it, uh, on the floor on June 2nd. Uh, so these issues are coming to fruition uh, in a very, very rapid way. Hearings have focused on the trade dimension. Our Gary Huffbauer testified on those a few weeks ago. And so this nexus is already under active consideration, and our book attempts to address them. Um, as I say, this is only the first stage in a series of collaborative projects between WRI and ourselves on this interrelationship between the global economy and the global environmental issues. Uh, we, in fact, hope to announce, uh, perhaps as early as next week, uh, a major new foundation grant that will enable our two organizations to delve deeper into the international dimensions of these issues and look specifically at the role that bilateral trade agreements, the WTO sectoral agreements can play in bringing both the industrial and the developing nations together in trade and climate change policies that would be mutually supported. Uh, that series of studies that we are doing with WRI uh, have already been launched. We'll be proceeding over the coming months and year or so, uh, if not beyond, as this whole process begins to unfold on the global stage and certainly as a high priority for whichever of the current presidential candidates is elected, all have stated that international agreement and effort on climate change are at the top of their foreign policy priority lists and we hope our work will contribute to informing that process. Um, I want to first introduce uh, uh, Jonathan Lash, the president of WRI, our partner in this exercise, to also make some welcoming and introductory remarks to set the stage for this study and for the project. Uh, Jonathan has been president of WRI since 1993. Uh, he was also co-chair of President Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development during that period. He's been an advisor to the EPA, uh, to the USTR, as it has looked at the trade environmental linkages. Um, he's recently published Business Advantage in a Warming World in the Harvard Business Review. He's written widely on these issues and consulted actively on it, not only within this country, 
but on formal advisory groups in India, China, Japan, some of the major countries that will be involved in this issue at the international level. Uh, before he came to WRI, Jonathan directed the environmental law and policy program of the Vermont Law School and headed the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, where he in innovated a number of policy uh, uh, changes to deal with the environment there. We will then turn to the co-authors of our current study, or two of the co-authors, uh, Trevor Hauser and Rob Bradley. Uh, Rob is director of WRI's International Climate Policy Initiative. He was trained originally as a physicist, has degrees in both physical sciences and environmental sciences, and so brings that crucial dimension to the issue. The co-author from the Peterson Institute side is Trevor Hauser. He's a visiting fellow here, a partner in the Rhodium Group in New York, the recently renamed Rhodium Group in which he partners with our other close colleague and visiting fellow Dan Rosen. We view them as the Peterson Institute North and we're delighted that Trevor has co-authored this project. Uh, he has written previously for us on China's energy policy, China more broadly, uh, and we look forward to hearing from him and Rod on the project. But first to Jonathan to help lead it off and welcome to all of you to discuss this very intriguing and very important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, we're really delighted to have this opportunity to uh, work together with the Peterson Institute. Who else could have gotten Fred to dress in green and it's not St. Patrick's Day? So, <laughs> this, I, I take it this, this is the beginning of a trend. Um, he's going to become a liberal before we know it. <laughs> um, but it was our sense uh, that exactly because whatever set of solutions we eventually adopt as a nation and as a world to address climate change, they will have profound economic implications that we needed to look for a partner who could help us explore the ramifications of different policy approaches, answer some of the political questions that have to be answered in order for us to pass legislation, uh, and uh, begin to offer solutions that achieve the environmental goals while minimizing the economic dislocation. That's why we found this uh, such an important uh, partnership and, and why we've worked very hard with, with Fred and his team to find ways to extend it. Uh, and we're delighted that the work is going to go on. I, I want to say just a few things uh, about the <clears throat> political and policy context for this study before I turn it over to the, the two lead co-authors to talk about the specific content of the book. First of all, there are two very important processes that are underway in which the questions addressed by leveling the car carbon playing field are playing an important and increasingly significant role. First, there's a domestic legislative process which has gotten serious. Uh, and second, there is an international negotiation process which is operating under a December 2009 deadline to produce a global agreement uh, in Copenhagen when the 15th Conference of the Parties to the uh, uh, International Convention on Climate Change takes place. Uh, and I want to comment briefly on both of those and how they come together. First of all, to some obvious political observations. All three remaining presidential candidates have explicitly and unequivocally endorsed economy-wide strong cap-and-trade legislation to reduce U.S. Uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. And all three have been explicit in saying that the United States needs to re-engage in the international process um, as part of a broader rejection of unilateralism as a diplomatic approach for the United States. Uh, Twenty-one states have adopted their own cap and trade programs uh, and have said they will set out to reduce emissions even if there is no uh, you know, nationwide legislation. They represent more than half of the U.S. economy. Uh, leading uh, comp international companies have explicitly asked the Congress to regulate them. The United States Climate Action Partnership, which we're very proud to be part of, 
uh, has endorsed economy-wide cap-and-trade legislation uh, that would make 60 to 80 percent cuts in U.S. emissions uh, over the next 40 years. Uh, U.S. cap now includes uh, companies who have a collective market capitalization of about three trillion dollars. Uh, so they're players. Um, <clears throat> most importantly, uh, they are asking for certainty, saying as we get ready to compete in tomorrow's markets, uh, as we move to a low carbon economy, we need certainty about rules and prices. And secondly, they ask again and again for assurances that policies will create a level playing field, which is very much uh, the, the starting point uh, for the study we're launching today. And finally, it, it's clear that Congress is responding. Not only will the Lieberman-Warner bill uh, be debated before the Senate uh, starting June 2nd, uh, Chairman Boxer has uh, announced uh, a chair's substitute for the bill, uh, which has become public today. But there were uh, two very significant votes in the Senate last week. Uh, first, Senator DeMint uh, proposed a resolution which was essentially a, a replay of the Bird Hagel resolution uh, that sent the U.S. delegation to the Kyoto negotiations in 1997 with the instruction not to bring back any agreement that didn't impose equal obligations on China. Uh, the U.S. did bring back an agreement that did not impose equal obligations on China. Uh, the Bird hagel resolution had passed 92 to nothing, and the Kyoto Protocol was never submitted for ratification. Uh, ultimately, I think U.S. participation and then failure to ratify uh, created damage to the process that we're still trying to recover from. When Senator DeMint submitted his resolution last Friday uh, to essentially give the same set of instructions, it was defeated on a vote of 34 to 61. So there's been a real change of the politics in the United States Senate. When Senator Boxer then offered a resolution that endorsed the idea of economy-wide cap-and-trade, provided that we deal with the issues of international fairness, uh, it passed with 55 votes and a number of senators uh, not voting. So there is political movement on this set of issues. Secondly, as the nations of the world move toward the major international meeting in Copenhagen, they do so based on a, an agreement uh, reached at the last moment in the, the last international meeting in Bali in December of 2007, which commits all nations to explicitly agree to adopt measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but leave space for different nations to take different approaches. That is, there is a commitment from China to take measures to reduce emissions, but not a requirement that if the U.S. takes a cap and agrees to a cap and trade mechanism that China's approach has to be the same. That's a crucial piece of defining the carbon playing field that we're interested in leveling. Countries, after all, differ in many ways. Labor prices are different from country to country. Working practices are different. Uh, Health care costs are allocated differently from country to country. Pension costs. Taxation is different from country to country. Energy prices are often different. Environmental regulations are certainly uh, strongly different. And currency values are different, a major issue of contention between us and China. The shifts in U.S. currency can be seen as having imposed a heavy tax on those who have to import uh, goods from Europe uh, and uh, to have given a significant advantage to U.S. industries that export. It's within that context that it's important to consider some of the issues that we're going to address about how the U.S. will deal with a global economy in which some countries, importantly China and India, are regulating their emissions differently than the U.S. One final observation before we hand this over to Trevor and Rob about keeping all this in proportion. Since 2003, oil prices have imposed uh, 
the equivalent of a carbon tax of $200 a ton on users of oil. And our economy has only just begun to significantly respond. There is no prediction, there is no prediction that the kind of cap and trade legislation under discussion now would create carbon prices anything remotely like what oil prices have done in the past five or six years. So we need to keep all this in proportion. There are real winners and losers. There will be real winners and losers. Um, but we're not talking in the short term of total economic disruption. Uh, Rob, are you starting? So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, my colleague and, and friend Rob Bradley, uh, who will give you an overview. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're absolutely delighted to be here, um, not only with, with such a terrific audience, but also to be, to be kicking off and, and uh, some of the, of the leading products of our partnership with the Peterson Institute, which has already for us been an absolutely fascinating and, and fruitful one. Um, in, uh, in illustration of the new Entente Cordiale, since Fred went so far as to put on green, um, you've got an environmentalist in pinstripes. Every little helps. <laughs> um, um, so. Leveling the carbon play playing field, Trevor in a little while is going to talk us through um, what we did and what we concluded from it. Um, I want to just set, a, set the scene a little bit at, the fir at first by, say, by asking the question, well, why did we do it in the first place? Obviously, one of the principal motivations was to meet you all over a nice lunch. Um, but there's a bigger setting here, which I think it's worth bearing in mind. Um, in particular, it doesn't get a lot of rehearsal um, in Washington discussions, um, and it has um, has significant implications for the kinds of choices that we're going to make in U.S. policy. Um, so as Jonathan indicated, there are, um, there's a raft of bills at the moment. The Lieberman Warner bill um, is the most prominent of them. Um, we won't spend any time um, looking at them here, but I think the important thing for us to understand is that over the next 50 years, um, emissions within the United States um, under some of these bills are likely to, to take a significant constraint. It's important to bear that in mind because for all that um, it's possible to exaggerate the immediate impact of some of these, uh, some of these bills on prices uh, and on welfare, um, in the longer term, the implication of climate change as a whole is that transformative change is going to need to take place in our economies. Um, and in, it's in thinking about how that transformative change occurs um, that we're really going to have to um, place the context of these broader discussions. Um, that has led, um, in particular, to concerns around some of the industries, if you like, who have identified themselves as potential losers. Um, and in particular, we're talking here about industry sectors which are both um, highly traded internationally and therefore susceptible to international competition. Um, producers have very little ability to pass on increased costs to their consumers. And also where those costs are significant, where the cost of energy uh, and therefore of carbon uh, will have some significant role in their... Um, in their overall cost profile um, for goods shipped. Um, Trevor will describe a little later how we identify those, but it's a fairly familiar list of industries. We're talking about iron and steel, we're talking about some of the non-ferrous metals, some of the basic chemicals, cement, lime, um, and similar products. Um, one of the options, therefore, that's being explored by Congress at the moment is to, impose, to attempt to impose indirectly um, the same costs on foreign producers that are being imposed directly by U.S. climate policy on producers within the United States. Um, the way in which that they seek to do that is to impose what amounts to um, a levy at the border for goods with a high, um, content, a high uh, carbon content in the production process. Um, there are a number of ways in which one can attempt to formulate this. Um, the Europeans, as we'll see in a moment, um, think of this more or less as a straight tax um, issue. Um, the structure within Lieberman Warner is a little bit more complex. Um, it's around acquiring allowances. But essentially, the idea is the same. Chinese steel producer arrives at the border, um, and a levy is placed on them in the form of either a tax or a requirement to, uh, to purchase allowances. And there are two assumptions behind that. One is that that helps you deal with the competitive exposure to U.S. business. Um, and thus, to mitigate some of the potential leakage both of carbon as, as emissions move from one jurisdiction to a less regulated jurisdiction. Um, and secondly, of course, 
and, and most politically important um, of US jobs. But there is a second rationale to it as well. The idea is that um, if countries uh, that are not currently engaged in climate policy see potential markets be, uh, see their markets be potentially um, threatened by the imposition of these kinds of trade measures, they will be in some, some, in some sense cajoled or coerced towards the negotiating table uh, and undertake um, significant climate action of their own. Um, therefore, it behooves us a little bit to think about what is going on in the rest of the world and how the rest of the world is going to approach um, that kind, of, uh, that kind of, of, uh, of tactic from the United States. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that much as the discussion here in Washington is about the US taking on a leadership role, and that's certainly something that the world badly needs, um, there's still a considerable amount of catching up to do until the United States is actually playing on an equal basis with some of our major trading partners. The European Union has had an emission trading system in place now for three years. It's just entering its, its second phase. Um, it's had teething problems galore, but it's worth bearing in mind that despite sort of volatility in the spot markets, you've actually seen a pretty steady forward price of, of carbon in the, United, in, the, in the EU. They actually expressed it in terms of, of price per um, ton of carbon dioxide, um, which equates to something in the $30 to $40 a ton range. Um, which is in excess of most of the estimates of what, of what uh, US bills are likely to produce in the near term. Um, not surprisingly, therefore, the European Union is, is debating many of the same um, questions, and, and I would encourage you not to try and uh, damage your eyes with the blurry writing here, but this is a, 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 um, a very sketchy analysis of some exposed sectors in Germany, similar set of sectors, similar set of exposure to, uh, to international trade and to energy costs, but just to illustrate that um, the same agonies are very much being, um, being undergone in the EU. And the political response to that is in some ways analogous, although the EU has been perhaps a little bit more restrained in the way that, that, uh, that those kinds of measures have been, have been discussed. Um, certainly, um, the European Union in its early phases gave free allocation within the emissions trading system, uh, um, gave away the emission rights for free um, in an effort to spare some of, the, some of the upfront costs for the covered businesses. Um, that's rapidly moving to a presumption of full auctioning. So 100% of the allowances will need to be purchased. Um, but there is, um, there is some caveat around how um, energy-intensive industries that are exposed to international competition will be treated. Maybe they'll continue to get a certain amount of free allocation. Um, but that's a, a centerpiece of the EU thinking on how to deal with this challenge. There has been a lot of discussion around imposing international trade-related measures. Um, in general, those have tended to be quashed, and it's a divisive issue within the EU. Um, France, Italy, the European Parliament, for instance, have all been quite enthusiastic um, about imposing those kinds of border tariffs. Um, other voices, like the Scandinavians, the UK, the European Commission, have tended to say, whoa, it's not worth getting into trade wars about this. We need to have more constructive external engagement. Um, it's an interesting um, precursor to the, to the discussion we're having here, but it's worth bearing in mind that where, that where the EU is looking is not China, but the United States. So it's the United States is the country that um, many have advocated putting on these border tax measures to coerce the United States to the negotiating table. Um, and I think those of you who live in Washington will have a good idea of how well the United States and, and its, and its um, leaders would have responded to any such attempt at coercion. <coughs> Um, similarly, in China, um, although a cap-and-trade system hasn't been implemented, um, there is, in fact, arguably a lot more going on on climate change at the moment in, in China um, than there is still in the United States. Um, certainly, the awareness of the acute vulnerability of China to climate impacts um, is extremely high. Um, water availability, agricultural productivity, and the vulnerability of coastal populations and, and delta populations. There are 400 million people in China who would be directly threatened by a couple of meters of sea level rise. Um, these, are, these are big security issues if you're China. The idea that China um, as a country will have to be coerced to the negotiating table, I think ignores the, um, the very high degree of attention that this issue is now getting in Beijing. Secondly, there are some policies and measures, and, and the Chinese about this time last year put out a climate change program um, which I think compare pretty well with, with anything going on elsewhere in the world, certainly anywhere outside Europe, um, in terms of renewable energy policies, energy intensity targets, fuel efficiency targets. Um, certainly implementing things in China is a tall order, um, but there's genuine sign of movement. Um, 
I think it would be physically impossible for China to be putting up a lot of renewable energy um, technologies faster than they are currently doing. Um, in wind in particular, the limitation seems to be around some fairly basic components and indeed the ability to build roads fast enough to get to the new, to the new sites. There is a lot of movement going on there and there's a lot of scope for genuinely constructive engagement. Um, which brings us therefore to the, to the international scope for that, for that negotiation and engagement to take place. Um, I wouldn't spend too much time dwelling on this. Um, as as Sir Frank Loy will tell you, the, the best thing to do with climate negotiators is keep them busy. And um, these people can be seeing very little of their families. Um, we've got a UNFCCC process, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, which is meeting at least four times a year. Um, there are meetings of the G8 that are f in which climate change is very much a priority issue. There's the um, United States uh, under the Bush administration last year decided that we didn't really have enough of, the, enough of these fora going on and set up the major economies meeting um, as another opportunity for these people to get to know each other. Um, there are regional groupings like the Asia Pacific Partnership which is bringing many of these um, same sectors together to talk about ways in which we can collaborate internationally. So there is a lot of scope there. Um, just very briefly, um, the, uh, the Bali Action Plan under the United Nations framework um, that was agreed last year focuses specifically, and it's a radical departure from the Kyoto Protocol. Um, I think this is perhaps not widely, under, widely recognized in Washington discussions yet. Um, but developing country mitigation actions are, are very explicitly included. Um, there is a lot more focus on technology development and transfer, including in some of these, you know, some of these technologies and approaches that are based around the idea of engaging specific sensitive sectors is also um, very much part of that, uh, of that discussion. Um, a lot of the developing country actions would be supported uh, initial, at least initially by technology transfer and financial support, um, but we also see text that's specifically around, um, around um, individual sectors that, are, that do not have this accompanying text about financial support, and there's a very clear reason for that. Um, these, are these are sectors where developed and developing countries are expecting to play more or less as equals um, and that certainly um, the idea will not be that financial support from the US or from Europe will transform um, the, the steel sector. Um, it's, it's interesting to, to note that in some of the um, amendments coming out to the Lieberman Warner um, uh, bill right now, um, a provision has actually been made to, to ensure that offsets, um, carbon offsets that are being bought from um, developing countries um, do not in fact go to companies and sectors that are directly competing with uh, US companies. Um, that's been quite an interesting, interesting development and certainly begs the question of how we're going to structure um, some of those agreements. So there is a real potential out there for multilateral engagement. There is a lot of movement on the international scene. At the same time, there are, there are other countries, particularly in the European Union, but this also goes for, Ch uh, for, for Japan, Canada, Australia, and others, um, that are wrestling with very much the same sets of questions. Um, but as we approach the ways in which we deal with those in the, EU, in, in the US, um, we, need to be, we need to bear in mind that um, the view that the US is a lonely leader in desperate need of protection from some of these cost differentials is not yet one that's widely, sh widely shared in the, in, the, in the rest of the world. So we decided to take a closer look um, at what some of the, some of the trade, trade flows and some of the, of the carbon profiles really meant for the success of some of those US policies. Um, and that is the subject um, that Trevor will introduce us to next. We are. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks, Rob, uh, for, uh, for your presentation, and uh, Fred and Jonathan uh, for introducing us. I just want to take a moment and recognize our three other co-authors on this uh, project, uh, Robert Hellmeyer, uh, Jake Worksman, and Britt Childs, who are buried among you like moles uh, out there in the audience. And uh, they all contributed quite substantively to this, uh, to this project. Um, Rob did a great job of laying out the international context and what's going on in Europe. I'm going to go through some of the key findings from the study we did assessing policy options here in the U.S. Uh, before I do that, I want to make a couple points on the economic backdrop uh, against which this uh, climate policy debate is taking place here in the U.S. 
So we've seen over the past uh, 15 years a decline in manufacturing uh, as role in the U.S. economy, both in terms of overall economic output uh, and employment. Uh, there's a number of factors that have contributed to that, a topic on which this House has written a great deal, uh, but certainly trade looms large in the mind of policymakers as a driving force of those changes, and trade is very much uh, in the background of this discussion of climate policy today and the impacts that it might have on trade-exposed carbon-intensive industries. And within the trade debate, of course, the 800-pound grill in the room is China. Now that's important when we talk about climate policy for a couple reasons. Uh, one, because concerns about the competitiveness of those trade exposed industries, as Rob mentioned, have, have become a make or break issue uh, for the passage of US climate policy. Uh, but also because China is now the largest CO2 emitter in the world. And so how we address these issues has a lot to say about whether or not uh, we'll be successful over the long term in addressing global climate change. So we started our study with an assessment of what industries would actually be impacted. And the way that we went about doing this was measuring the two indicators that Rob spoke about. So the first is the share of production costs that come from energy. Energy is a cost of goods sold for industry, right, uh, as a rough metric for what additional costs climate policy would put on those industries. Uh, that's measured on the x-axis on this chart to my left. On the y-axis is the trade exposure of those industries, and so the industry's ability to pass those costs on to consumers in the face of international competition. And so the five bubbles that I have highlighted are the five uh, top-level industries that we focus on in the study, and this isn't a surprising list to anyone. In fact, it's the exact list that's mentioned in many of the U.S. climate policy proposals. So we have chemicals, non-ferrous metals, meaning uh, aluminum and copper, uh, ferrous metals, it's iron and steel, non-metallic mineral products, uh, which is cement and glass, and, uh, and paper and pulp. Refining we don't include in the, uh, in the study because it's treated differently under most U.S. climate policy proposals, not as a carbon-intensive uh, industry. Uh, these five industries combined account for about 3% uh, of U.S. economic output, and they account for about 2% of U.S. employment. If you dig down deeper within each of these uh, super sectors down to the subsectors. There's a number of subsectors that aren't, in fact, that vulnerable uh, to uh, to climate costs. For example, in the chemical industry, uh, of the trillion dollars in global chemical trade uh, worldwide, we estimate that only about 37 billion of that is the basic commodity chemicals for which energy is a significant cost of goods sold. Here in the U.S., petrochemicals production, methanol production, the things for which energy is a significant cost uh, would certainly see some impact. The downstream value-added chemical products, the pharmaceuticals and the products which really create economic value and employment are less vulnerable to climate uh, considerations. That said, there are certainly some politically sensitive and economically important industries like iron and steel and aluminum and cement uh, that would be impacted by U.S. climate policy. And there's a number of proposals on, on how to address that uh, that Rob mentioned. And let me clarify again the two uh, justifications, uh, the two driving forces for policies to address these competitiveness concerns. And the first is preventing a loss of competitiveness from climate policy. So shielding domestic industry that might face a competitive disadvantage in a global economy where, uh, where other firms don't face similar costs. Now that's important for economic reasons, and it's also important for climate reasons, lest migration of industry from the U.S. to elsewhere in the world undermine the effectiveness of U.S. climate policy. Now the second motivation for these provisions is, uh, is that the threat of a border adjustment uh, on imports from countries that hadn't taken comparable climate policy would be a useful negotiating tool to induce other countries, uh, and by other countries, most folks mean China and India, to take a different climate policy than they would otherwise. And we think it's useful to treat these two uh, outcomes separately uh, for our discussion here, because one basket of policy approaches might be very successful in addressing the competitiveness concerns, and another basket of policy approaches might be the right one for inducing other countries uh, to take action on climate change. So let me start with the, uh, with the first one. And the way we look at how effective trade provisions would be in, uh, in, in preventing emissions leakage or addressing competitiveness concerns is by looking at where the imports are coming from. And now China is very much what we're thinking about when we contemplate these provisions, yet when we look at the league tables for imports into the U.S. of carbon-intensive goods, China ranks sixth in uh, aluminum, fifth in steel, doesn't even make the chart in, chem in basic chemicals. A little bit higher in paper at only 3%, so the one outlier is, is cement, 
the kind of classic non-tradable, ironically, that 14% of U.S. cement imports come from China. But on the whole, the majority of U.S. imports of carbon-intensive goods either come from developed countries that either have already taken more aggressive climate policy than the U.S. or are likely to act alongside the U.S. in a post-Kyoto world, or from developing countries that have a lower carbon intensity of production uh, than the U.S. does. This maps out some carbon intensity of production for four of the five industries that we look at. And while the U.S. is cleaner uh, than India and China in most of these industries, uh, U.S. production on average is more carbon intensive than many Middle Eastern, European, or Latin American producers. So while trade measures might protect U.S. industry from Chinese imports, uh, if it's assessed based on the carbon intensity of production, it wouldn't necessarily protect U.S. producers from imports from developing countries that rely on cleaner sources of energy like hydropower or natural gas. Uh, in addition, the imports from countries like China or India that have a higher carbon intensity of production might find their way into the U.S. Uh, through, through different means if the U.S. acts unilaterally. If the U.S. was to impose a trade measure on China, either because it hadn't signed onto a post-Kyoto agreement or because its average carbon intensity of production was higher than the U.S., if Japan wasn't acting in concert, then Japan could import Chinese steel for domestic consumption, freeing up Japanese-produced steel for export to the U.S. These are commoditized products, and so there are uh, transshipment and boundary issues that if the U.S. acts unilaterally on are difficult to address. Also, most pr proposals in U.S. legislation today only deal with the domestic market and uh, protecting domestic producers here at home. Uh, that's important. Yet most of the demand growth that we've seen over the past 15 years, and indeed most of the demand growth we're going to see over the next 50 for these goods, these carbon intensive goods that are tied to urbanization, comes from emerging economies, not from the OECD. And so here I break down demand growth over the past uh, 14 years uh, between Annex I countries, so those developed countries that were listed in Annex I of the UNFCCC, and developing countries, as you can see, particularly in, in infrastructure-tied uh, goods like steel, aluminum, and cement, most of the demand growth comes from the developing world. This is an important consideration in are we just looking at leveling the playing field here at home or creating a level playing field for U.S. firms overseas. Let me turn to the second uh, objective now, which is that the threat of trade measures would, uh, would create incentives uh, or, or a stick, you might say, to bring China and India to the negotiating table. Uh, while exports from China are a significant, to the U.S. are a significant uh, portion of Chinese GDP, exports of carbon intensive goods are not, unfortunately <laughs> for us. Uh, China accounts for 32 percent of global steel production. Well, that was 2005. It's about 36 percent today. 90% of that is for domestic consumption because of the urbanization trends that are taking place in the developing world, China in particular. Only 1% of China's steel is exported to the U.S. If we take all five of these carbon intensive industries and add them up, exports to the U.S. account for about 0.2% of Chinese GDP. If we look at the history of the threat of trade sanctions against China when there was far more at stake in economic terms, uh, the record isn't quite good. Uh, and if we look at uh, using the threat of sanctions on 0.2 percent of Chinese GDP, uh, it's unlikely, given the cost of climate policy, that that'll be enough to bring China to the table. In addition, China's already actively taking steps to curb exports in those industries itself for local energy and environmental reasons. Uh, the steel industry in China consumes about 18 percent of the country's energy resources and accounts for about 18 percent of the sulfur dioxide emissions that cost the country $200 billion uh, a year and 750,000 premature deaths. So it's become a priority for the government to uh, reduce growth in those industries. Uh, in July of last year, there was a change in the tax treatment at the border for Chinese exports of steel. Uh, if you calculate the effect of that in terms of a carbon tax, it would be like Beijing voluntarily imposing a $50 per ton of CO2 carbon tax on Chinese exports. And steel trade has responded. Uh, China's moved away from its net export position in steel, and many industry analysts uh, project that China may, in fact, become a net importer of steel, as well as aluminum, as early as next year. The good news out of that is that it means that China, as Rob mentioned, and other developing countries, while not receptive necessarily to a comparable economy-wide limit on emissions as the U.S., uh, may in fact be receptive to agreements to discipline 
key industries, uh, industries that, that, uh, that create uh, tensions here uh, in the US, iron and steel, aluminum, cement. This was something that was put on the Bali Action Plan uh, in, in December of last year and is gaining momentum in the run-up to Copenhagen. But of course, the outcome of international negotiations is unclear and the US is moving on climate policy today. And so what can we do to address uh, the concerns of these industries in a, in, a, in a period of uncertainty? And the good news there is that the five industries that we, uh, at, the, at, the, at the top end, that we uh, uh, identify as being vulnerable account for only 6% of US emissions, right, direct emissions, which means that there is ample room in the design of domestic climate policy to fully offset the costs to US industry until we get to a point where there's an international agreement without compromising the environmental effectiveness uh, of domestic policy. Uh, the House side is putting together a proposal on this right now, uh, Representative Inslee's office, called output-based rebating, and they work with resources for the future on this, that would uh, fully compensate cost to industry of, uh, of climate policy uh, while maintaining environmental incentives. And we hope that in the, as this debate evolves in the months ahead, that options like that uh, get a closer look. Thanks very much.